Um, so welcome everybody. We are recording. Great. And made sure that's working. Um, this, I am Jana Hexter. I work for the Northeastern IPM Center. Thank you for your patience uh, this afternoon. And hopefully the rest of it will go more smoothly than this. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping things uh, before, we, uh, before we move on. And um, the first is that this webinar actually has a DIY component of, of it. So we're going to be going through how to create um, an IPM plan. And um, we have uploaded a template of that plan onto the website. So if you, um, if you click on this link here, which you won't be able to click on, but you could type it in, um, you'll be brought to this website. And it's the same website, I believe, that you um, signed up for the, for the webinar. And um, on the top right hand corner, right where you see uh, Kim's uh, photograph of her looking at the honeybees longingly, um, you'll click there and, um, and you will be able to download uh, the template. And so I'm going to leave this um, on the screen while I say a couple of things and um, so that you have time to type that in and download it if you'd like to. I also sent you an email this morning for anyone who was registered. Um, actually, as of last week. So if you just registered today, you wouldn't have gotten that email. And in that email is also the link. So if it's easier for you to find that. Um, and if you can't click on this, you can't download it, don't worry, it'll be fine. <laughs> it's just, it might be easier or more fun if you can, but don't panic, we'll get a copy to you. Um, so thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have absolutely gorgeous weather here in Ithaca, New York. We actually have sunshine for the first time in days. It's actually still cold, but uh, the sunshine uh, cuts it. Um, though the, we are recording this, it takes us about a week to um, edit the recording and put it up on our website. And as you can see actually on this screen, um, the recording links for the first three are on there and you can go back and watch those if you hadn't seen them already. And, um, and this, the recording for this week's will be up hopefully by this time next week and I'll send you an email um, with the link to the recording as well. So don't worry that you will get that, um, but don't expect it this afternoon or tomorrow. And feel free to go back and look at the old recordings. <coughs> And then the other piece uh, that I request is that you use the Q&A feature um, that ha that's on Zoom. So if you scroll over your screen, um, either at the top or the bottom, this black box will appear. And in the middle of the black box is something that says Q&A. And if you click on there, um, you can type in a question and you can type in your question anonymously. So if you want to ask a question that you think is dumb that no one else has, and I assure you that is not true, uh, you can go in there and type your question and we'll get to as many as we can today. And, um, and hopefully we can answer it later if we don't get to it today. I ask that you don't use the chat feature um, to ask questions because we're not monitoring it. The advantage of the Q&A feature is that we can um, uh, check them if they've been answered. And if there's three people would ask the same question and we answer it, we can check off the other two. So it's easier for us to keep track. Whereas in the chat, um, it's hard for us to keep track of it. If you have a technical question, uh, you can put it in the chat because we have our webmaster here, uh, Kevin Judd, and he may be able to help you, maybe I'll be able to help you with that. Um, but just so you know, uh, we're monitoring the Q&A feature, the chat feature, not. So um, with that, um, we will move on and I will introduce um, Kim and Jen. And Dr. Kim Skirm is the Chief Apiary Inspector and Apiary Program Coordinator at the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resource, uh, Resources. And Jennifer Lund is the main state apiarist and has over 20 years of entomological experience. She's worked in many honeybee projects, including a national col colony collapse disorder study, honeybee colony health comparisons of top bar and Langstroth hives. And uh, what you will find out from just spending five minutes with either of these people is uh, that they totally love honeybees and they are totally into varroa mites and they have a uh, depth of experience and uh, wisdom and uh, research knowledge and fun that they all bring to the table. So I think you're going to have a blast learning from them today. 
So um, I am going to move on now and assuming that um, folks who wanted to download that have been able to. If you haven't been able to, don't panic. It'll be fine. I'm sure we'll work through it. Um, okay. So we have some questions for you uh, before we dive in. It gives us a sense of who is on the line and what kind of level of experience you have so that Jen and Kim can uh, tailor the questions on the fly. So you'll see here there's uh, a few questions. I think there's just three. And I will just be quiet while you answer them. There are no right and wrong answers. Put in whatever jumps to mind and um, and uh, as soon as you have completed the poll, it'll allow you to submit your answers. Uh, you need to do all, th all three questions to submit, so. Great, okay, so we can uh, close up the poll and, um, and we can share the results and hopefully you see the results there. So um, uh, the majority of people, 70%, uh, do incorporate IPM into their hive management. And uh, we have about a 50-50 split of um, whether people have an IPM plan. So that's interesting. Uh, some people will have plans and some don't. And, um, and um, for those who um, don't know, have a plan, it looks like the biggest reason is uh, not knowing how to make one. So um, perfect that you're here today because uh, Jen and Kim will help you with that. And um, yeah, and questions about appropriate use and best time of use, hopefully that will all become clear. And um, so we will move on. And for those folks who have IPM plans, hopefully yours will be better after today. And uh, for those who don't have a plan at all, Jen and Kim are gonna help you along the way. All right, so I will move on to the next slide and away you go. Oh, hi everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, can. good. Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. So um, it is a glorious day here in Maine as well. Um, and for those of you who are in Massachusetts and Maine, you know that today is a very important holiday. Um, it's actually a, a, a holiday in Maine, Massachusetts and Wisconsin for some reason. It's called Patriots Day. The rest of you don't get this holiday, but we get it off usually. So we're here today on this glorious day. Um, of the, uh, the of Patriots Day. So anyway, <laughs> that's just an aside. So a little quirk about Maine and New Hampshire. Um, I mean, Maine and uh, Massachusetts. Um, we celebrate a holiday that very few other people in the other in the rest of the state in the rest of the United States do. Um, so today we're going to look at integrated pest management. Just a quick overview: how to kind of the basics of what an IPM plan should look like, how to create one, and then we're going to actually show some examples at the end of, of uh, plans that have been, been made by other people. So next slide. Um, so yeah, perfect, great. So um, just quickly, IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management, and it's pretty much a series of tools that we use to control pests in any situation. It could be in your garden, in um, your house, but mostly, well, today we're gonna be talking about it in your, um, your hives, specifically when it relates to varroa mites. And in general, we like to look at this approach as a pyramid. So where you start with really good genetics in your hive, then do monitoring to t determine when your what your pest levels are and when you should be doing treatments, cultural controls, things that you can do to slow down that um, increase in mite populations, and then following up with miticides when you need to, and we, we base that on monitoring. So once you hit a threshold, then you have to um, do something to control them, and those are going to be your miticides. So next slide. So there are a lot of resources online. This, this is one that both Kim and I recommend all the time, the Honeybee Health Coalition Tools for Varroa Management. They're a, a great resource. What they do is they go and they comb through all of the, the research out there, uh, bring it into one central document and write it in a way that's easy for normal people to understand, which is the reason why I love it. Um, it's about 30 pages long, it's free, and if you just type in Honey Bee Health Coalition and Varroa, it should pop up as one of the first choices in a Google search. And they have this, this guide here, um, the tools for varroa management, and it goes through a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in the previous three webinars. So if you need a refresher course, um, this is a great document and it's completely free, which who doesn't love free? So next slide. 
Um, one other thing with that is they also have videos that um, show you, so if you are going to apply a miticide, um, they have videos showing you how to do that. If you want to do an alcohol roll, they have videos to show you how to do that. And so it's a really important resource. So we also have this quick document that we made up with um, the Northeast IPM Center um, that you can get on their website. We also are updating it, right, Kim? New versions coming out shortly, which uh, is updated. Um, and you can contact Kim or I, and we can send you one of these, or you can download it from the Northeast IPM website. So next slide. Um, oh, actually, great. Can, let's take one question, actually, because there's a, a question that two people asked. And, um, and so I think it would be a good one just to throw in that. Um, so Dorothy Karen said she asked her package supplier about treating her package. And she said she didn't know when it was last treated because the frames were made up from various hives. She didn't recommend treatment because there was no brood and the likelihood of mites was small. She told me to do a mite count and treatment once there was a brood present. Do you agree with this? And Steve Page said um, he had exactly the same question. Um, so he maybe had been told the same thing by the people that he got his package from. So um, mites, mites can absolutely still be in there, even if there is not brood. Um, they live, they can live and survive on adult bees. Um, and there, we call that the dispersal phase of the mites life cycle. And so what they do is they tuck themselves underneath the abdominal segments, in, in between the abdominal segments on the underside of the bees. And so it could quite possibly, you could have a big mite infestation in those and waiting to do a treatment um, until after there's brood president present, that actually makes it a little bit harder to do some of the treatments because that brood, the mites will go into the brood and not be on the adult bees, so they may not get as good a treatment. Do you agree, Kim? Perfect. Okay. And so I would say uh, do an alcohol roll and then um, if you need to, a treatment. Okay, great. And I want to say this is great because that's exactly what you guys recommended doing the last time we had the webinar. Someone's followed up and so <laughs> you get the first question. <laughs> Perfect. All right, great. So we'll move on and uh, we'll have more questions later, but we'll move on for now. Yep. So I love this slide. This is my favorite. Kim always makes this slide. So the fundamentals of a Varroa My IPM plan is, is really uh, being a planner. So determine your short and long-term goals of your apiary. Make sure that you know what you want to do going into the season, whether you're going to be ma managing for honey, for um, number of hives, if you're going to increase, or if you want, you know, if you're going to start raising queens, you want to know that ahead of time. You want to be practical. You want to schedule your time on your calendar for api apiary management to coincide with bee development. That doesn't mean that that may, that may change over time because um, bees, you know, they do what, what they want. They don't, they don't work on our schedule. So making sure though that you do have time set aside weekly to um, do some of those management things in your hive and check in and make sure what's going on. So be a keeper, monitor your hives frequently to determine mite levels and compare with established thresholds. You want to be monitoring. You can't make decisions on um, how to deal with mites if you don't know what's going on with the mites in your hive. So monitoring is very important. And we talked a lot about that in one of the previous seminar, uh, webinars. And be prepared. So you wanna incorporate both prevention and intervention tools. So you wanna make sure that you have those things on hand so you're not scrambling. If you have a huge mite population, you're not scrambling trying to get an order in and then things are back ordered and they can't come in and then you have to wait three weeks to get something. Along with that, you also wanna make sure that you have your PPE in advance. You wanna make sure you have the proper gloves if you need a respirator, your proper respirator and any other tools that you may need to, to do those treatments safely. And then you wanna be creative but safe. You want to use multiple tools safely to control mites. You don't want to um, be doing things that you read about maybe on a blog post that sound too good to be true because usually if it sounds too good to be true, it's not a good idea. Um, and there's a good chance you can either damage yourself doing it or kill your bees. And so you want to stay away from any of those things, but be creative, you know, try new things, you know, talk to other people. And if they're using a miticide that you've never tried and it sounds like it might work in your situation, you know, give it a try on a hive or two. Don't, don't do it on everything. Try it, try it out first. So next slide. 
And so we um, posted this um, kind of IPM plan worksheet up on the um, site. It was at the, one of the first pages. So if you have that, we're going to go kind of through this and talk about the different um, things that should be included, how to work through making a plan. And um, yeah, so that's what it looks like. So next slide. And there's a link to the form. Okay, Give you okay. a couple seconds to write that down or find it. Yep, and if you were registered um, as of last week, I sent an email to everyone this morning with a link to that too, which might be the easiest way for you guys to do that. So, all right. Wonderful. And now I'm passing it over. All right, I feel like we're running a marathon. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Um, yeah, so uh, a couple of things. I, I appreciate Jen talking about Patriots Day. It's always funny when I talk about Patriots Day. My family thinks I'm talking about the Patriots football team. So I have to very quickly remind them that I'm, you know, still a Southern human at heart. So, you know, go, go Falcons. Anyways, um, so uh, real quick, too, I just want to make a quick shout out to Earth Day. It's happening on Wednesday. What a great way to spend Earth Day almost with all of you. So there are a couple of um, really great webinars that are out there on bees this week. So do a quick Google search if you want to keep your learning going here for the week. Um, so we're going to actually go through this. The goal with making this IPM plan was to create something for folks that were, was really simple to use and that didn't feel overwhelming and hopefully give you a lot of space if you are someone that likes to take notes or someone that you know, would like to have all, all options and alternatives. Um, there's a lot of space here. Obviously, this is not meant to be the only thing that you should ever use, nor is it meant to be the end all be all to understanding how to make an IPM plan. It's really just a great way to start thinking about this and hopefully uh, opportunity for you to get some of your thoughts down. So when you're going through this, if you printed this off or if you've got it right in front of you, just a couple of tips and kind of how you think about starting this. Um, obviously, you may, may want to make a couple copies, right? I mean, all of us are working through this and if you're just getting your bees, you're still trying to learn what you may need or what you may not need. And more importantly, you know, what kind of apiary you'd like to manage, as Jen mentioned, and, and then what kind of beekeeper you'd like to be. Or, you know, you're someone that would like to use a certain set of tools or, or, you, or you're an apiary that would like to be specific in how you're managing bees. And so that may either eliminate or, or increase your opportunities to use other tools. So, um, you know, be as, as lenient with yourself as far as filling out info. If you've got blank spaces, you know, don't beat yourself up about it. There's a lot of places in here that you can fill in later. And honestly, you'll notice and at the end of this, some of the sample plans, we leave blank space because there's always uh, potential for things to happen that you may not have planned for. It's nice to have a little blank space there. Um, and Jim mentioned earlier too about thinking about your schedule. So this is really important. When we do IPM management, or, uh, we do my management and think about IPM and the state apiaries that we manage as part of the state program in Massachusetts, we're always thinking about our schedule. Now granted, you know, we're coming at this from a different place because we're providing support to beekeepers, but obviously as a beekeeper, um, in addition to managing bees, right, we've got other things happening in our lives. So, you know, if you know you're going to be on vacation or if you know, you know, certain times of the year are really hard for you, um, it might be a good time for you to be realistic in how you're thinking about this. And, you know, don't, don't kid yourself when, oh yeah, I can totally fit that in. You know, bees are going to suffer for it. So, be, be real be real clear with yourself about what you think your schedule is going to be. Um, the other thing is we think about colony development, especially for us in the Northeast in New England, you know, it's hard. We've got a, a really challenging weather pattern to deal with and how bees are responding to that. I mean, now there's a great example. I know we, some folks probably got cold, uh, snow and a, and a cold snap last week. And, and uh, for instance, we woke up uh, in my area in Massachusetts to a soft frost on uh, Sunday morning. It was like, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is wild. So, you know, there's going to be some developmental changes that happen throughout the season and plan as best you can. So, you know, with, with some backup ideas. Um, the other big piece to this, and I, I always encourage people, you know, just like a honey beehive is, is a collective of individuals working together for a common goal to keep the hive healthy and keep the hive functioning and developing. Beekeepers also do a great job of mimicking a honey beehive. I mean, you all work together for the most part. And most people are not keeping bees in a vacuum. Um, if you're struggling to find a mentor, or you're struggling to find additional support, there's probably a good chance there's a county organization near where you live, um, and you can definitely check that out. You can Google them. I know in Maine, Jim can probably quickly um, thumbs up or thumbs down. You've got a whole group of county folks that are available at the organizational level, maybe local. So, yeah, and, and even in your state, there may be a state-level organization. So, 
you know, it, it's really fun. You could, you could go through this, you could print it off, you could fill it in, um, and then take it to your next B meeting as soon as we can all start congregating again um, after this COVID stuff and you know, have a chance to have some open dialogue and see what other people are doing. So that's why it's a good, again, idea to leave some space. Um, the other thing, and I find this often, right, we do all these steps, we make a plan, and then, oh, goodness, where do we put that thing? So, you know, be real diligent right when you start with this, saying, okay, I'm going to make this my IPM notebook or my apiary notebook and you know, put this inside of that and, and store it in a place that you can remember. You know, a, a common one that I think a lot of beekeepers like to use is near where their equipment is to work the apiary or if you're someone that, you know, needs a constant reminder, right, maybe it's something you put on your refrigerator or something that you put on an area that you frequent look at or that you're likely to see it to jog in memory. Oh yeah, I got to go check my bees this week. Or oh yeah, I got to make sure I order that equipment to put on for my management. Um, the last couple of things here, again, are about calendar, thinking about management. Um, and Jen mentioned this too, purchasing supplies in advance. So, you know, now's a good time, I think, to really think about that, especially for the season. Most of us, right, have a little bit more time than we ever thought we would have um, working at home and being isolated. So, you know, go take the opportunity, go see the catalogs, go online and see what available equipment is out there and the suppliers and, and put an order in. It may take a little longer to get it. Um, you know, for whatever reason right now due to shipping and you know, issues with getting materials, but now's the time to do that. So it's a good thing to, to do and put your orders in now. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and we're going to say this multiple times, and we can't, I feel like you can never say it enough, is that you're going to want to monitor your mites a lot, right? So you, if you apply a chemical treatment um, as an intervention tool, then you're going to want to make sure that works. So you're not just going to be thinking about when you're going to monitor mites and then a one time, but also you have to account for and plan the after treatment monitor. So a lot of times I see this with beekeepers who plan the after treatment monitoring of when the mic treatment needs to come off. So they will typically do that in the same session or the same day so they can be more efficient. So that's something to, to keep in mind if you're, you know, doing this plan and you say, oh, I've only got, you know, 15 minutes on this day, but I want to go in and work my bees. Then if you're going to take a treatment off or that's your plan to take a treatment off that you put on, put a little extra time in or maybe choose a different day that you can do that um, so you can also do a mic uh, account as well. So just a couple of ideas as you're thinking about this and some of you may have already gone oh yes I can feel this out. These are good things to think about and I'm glad you mentioned some of the tips but we're going to now go through each section of this and again give you a chance to kind of prompt how you're thinking about it and the goal in this um, is taking this section by section is that you have time to again digest each part of this, um, you know, sit and think while we're talking um, or you can even mute us, right, and watch the screen um, and see the material written and, and really do take some time. And if you don't have a copy of this or aren't able to get one, um, you know, yeah, like Donna said, you can either you can be able to get to that at some point, but you can also just write notes. So if there are things you want to write down for each section, you can always translate that later and put it into a, an actual document if you'd like to keep it in this format. So let's start with the easy stuff. I always like this part. It's always good to start off small. So let's go to the next slide and we'll show you right at the very top of this, super easy. Um, for example, 2020 would be the year, the apiary name, if you've got you know, just one apiary, obviously that is something you could just put home or you know, backyard. If you've got multiple, you again may need multiple sheets. So this could be your out yard or this could be you know, whatever address that the breeding yard is located. And then the hive types, and this may be mixed. So I understand that some folks may keep different types of hives. So this could be something like, you know, I'm keeping 10 frame length straw hives or I'm, I've got a ware hive, or I've got a long hive. So this is a good way for you, uh, again, to think about as you're going through the management and the mite treatment aspect, to think about what fits into that type of hive. So make some notes on this. Um, we did mention it before, but if you do have a pencil handy, I always find, right, it's easier to have something that you can erase. So uh, if you don't want to make extra copies, but it might be a good time to grab that too. So let's go down, we, we did the easy part, let's go down each section by section. So you obviously see on this IPM plan, the months are listed and we aggregated winter down at the bottom and we'll talk a little bit about why we did that um, when we start going through them. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see, we'll start with colony inspection. So this again is when you're thinking about when you may be able to get into your bees. So, and when we think about an inspection, I'm using that word intentional because it's an opportunity for you to look at the hive, whether it be an internal or sorry, an external inspection where you're looking at just the inserts of the hive or you're actually opening you know, the inner cover, you're just doing a quick peek to see if bees are you know, looking at you, if you've got obviously a live hive or if you've got a lot of population, is it time, oh wow, there's a lot of bees in here, I need to think about doing a mite treatment, that kind of thing, really quick check. 
Um, and maybe that's because of, of weather, right? You don't want to damage bees by opening them up for an extended period of time if it's too cool outside. And then of course, the other one that I think the other, the last uh, option here is the fully open hive. So that's kind of, I think what most people would consider, you know, visiting an apiary and doing an inspection. And I just put down a couple examples. You could do weekly, right? By weekly, monthly. I do want to discourage folks, and Jen, please chime in if you think differently, but we do have people that get really excited, and I understand that you may be really, really excited to work bees right now and have more time than you ever thought you would have to work bees who do not require you to be socially distant, right, if you're working them by yourself, so it's an ideal situation, but that does not mean that you want to open up your hive daily or even every other day, so, you know, you want to be cautious, too. I mean, imagine this is their home, so if someone came and ripped the roof off of your house every day and looked in on you probably would not be very conducive to you surviving in the space. So, you know, be real careful about how you think about um, when you want to work the bees. And I'd say weekly is, is even a, in some times of the year, maybe uh, kind of in a real intense way to work bees, but definitely not daily. So Jen, again, feel free to chime in if you've got any other thoughts on that, but we just want to discourage you. We're trying to also think about your bees here. So these girls really appreciate you and obviously care about you as their beekeeper, but they don't want to see you every day, so be a little careful with that. Um, I do also think the other extreme of this exists, where you don't want to be in your bees, you know, every three months or once a season. You've got to find a little balance here. So, you know, whatever, the biggest thing that I use for an indicator for this section is the weather, right? So, you know, we don't want to damage any brood. If it's really, really cool outside, uh, for instance, when we got snow last week, that's probably not a great day to go in your bees. If it's too cool, you don't want to have an opportunity where you'll chill or cause damage to developing bees by uh, having that temperature uh, hit them in a negative way. So put this on your calendar. Again, I typically do this, um, have this sheet or you know, scribble a version of this and have my calendar open at the same time so I can plan as best I can. Um, all right, so let's go to the next column. We talked a little bit about the, the inspection part. The population, so the population piece is gonna be critical because when you do your inspection, um, will obviously tie into when there may be an increase in population as far as my management goes. So, uh, you know, again, a lot of the things on this page are, are very interconnected and these are just ways to, uh, you can't really think about them singularly in a vacuum. You've got to consider the other pieces, but once you start writing down the sections, right, if you've got a pencil, you can go back and make some changes if you go, oh goodness, that's not going to work right now because it's too cool. Um, but the, the hive development uh, section here, this colony population is, is, again, making you think about the stage of development. So I'm going to use uh, reference again to the Honey Bee Health Coalition Guide. It's really the best, fantastic resource that Jen talked about, and we like having reference to that. And we're going to go through a chart that they have at the very beginning of that guide where they list basically four um, stages of, of population development in honeybee hive, right? So dormant would be kind of a winter time period, the increase in population that spring, summer, uh, when the population of bees is increasing, right? You need more bees, the hive is growing in numbers, so the queen is able to lay more eggs, um, and then those bees emerge. And then, of course, the peak, when there's the most bees in the hive, the most amount of adult bees, the most amount of brood, that queen is really maxed out, they're doing great. Um, and then, of course, the decrease, right? When they're getting ready to, they've ramped up ready for winter, now they're preparing to get everything together to go into a dormant period um, that, that goes into that fall, late fall and winter time period. So if we go to the next slide, we'll show you this in a visual way. And if you download the Honey Bee Health Coalition, it's on page six. So if you've got that open and you want to go through that at the same time, you'll see it there. I added a couple things to this. So the first is we're going to talk about the brood line. So this is the bee population. Now, some of you may be going, whoa, this is a little misleading. It says Varroa mite life cycle. Well, we've got to think about Varroa mites when we think about bees, right? Because they're hand in hand. So if we look at the blue line, that's when the bee population is going through those four different phases we talked about. So typically, right, there's that dormant phase in the winter, then bees start increasing spring, summer for us uh, in this area. And then we usually get a population peak. And again, all of this is dependent on the external weather, but sometime maybe late summer, early fall, even mid fall. Um, and then that starts to decrease, right, with that number four um, getting ready for winter. And then we eventually go back into winter again. So if we do the same thing uh, with the same development cycle with mites and go to the next slide, you'll see it's actually quite a bit different. So now we're looking at the orange section of this slide. So for mite populations, right, they're in actually when the bee population is increasing, the mite population is still fairly dormant. So it takes them quite a bit of time 
to ramp up to their what would be population increase when the bee population has peaked, right? They're still ramping up. And then eventually, once that population of bees peaks, mites finally go to their population peak um, at the same time when the bee population has started to decrease. So this is very misleading, I think, and, and what catches beekeepers a lot is not realizing the slight um, overlap and, and distance of these two peak population peaks, right? So the mites peak after the bees peak not in, in the same time. So I see people go, oh, my bite, my, my colony was doing so great. There's no way they could have had a mite issue. You know, I put a mite treatment on, I, I, you know, I, I know it worked, it had to work. And then also they didn't think about checking it after doing the mite treatment. So doing that grow my count after the sample to see if it actually the treatment was efficacious. And they forgot that even though they applied a mite treatment during the population peak of the honeybees, they may have missed that population peak of the rural mites. So there's a real big piece of this that you've got to consider. And if you think about this while you're doing your IPM plan, this is going to be the keys to success. Because um, even though we loosely put some uh, seasons to these, pop these four stages, right, for bees and mites, it may be a little different depending on what area you're in. For instance, I think this year, parts of the South are reporting about three weeks ahead in their bee schedule. Um, that bee development, whereas we are, I would argue, uh, maybe we're ahead recently, but now we might be kind of getting back to the normal development. So it may depend, right, on what the weather looks like. So if we go to the next slide, we've got to think about that. And whenever you combine the development cycle of the honeybee, right, with the mite that we just saw on the, on the slide, it also helps us think um, at the same time, we have to think about what plants are available because we know that the plants in the landscape really drive honey production and obviously our ability as beekeepers to put on honey supers or think about or plan for honey supers uh, to make up the honey crop. And I don't know if, if everyone will agree, but I can definitely say the consensus in Massachusetts last year was that we had a bumper honey crop. And that was definitely not something that I think a lot of beekeepers planned for. So it put a little wrench in there uh, a lot of folks might manage their plans because they had anticipated a certain trend in, in honey production. And obviously that exceeded their expectations, which was wonderful, but it also made it really tight for them in the end of the season to quickly figure out and scramble how to manage for mite populations because of, the, of this increase. So, you know, again, we'll, we do the best we can to plan for this, but also kind of have that back of your mind, you know, alternative. So in this particular column, we want you to think about when you're going to put a super on and when you may not have a super. And you'll notice whenever we start going through some of the plans, this time period may overlap in months. So you may have a super, you know, right coming on in one half of the month and it may come off on the next half of the month. So this may not be as concrete as month to month. So you got to be a little flexible. So I just kind of want to show you this trend again if we go to the next slide and we think about honey supers. Um, and before we do that, there's a great example of a resource for you. So if you're new to this and you're not sure what plants uh, you know, may be coming on in your season that are available for bees to utilize to make honey and how you should think about when you should put on honey supers and take them off, or even if you're interested in this, um, this is a great website, uh, the National Phenology Network. And it gives you, especially for us in the spring, it gives us a great way to see when the, the plants are, are leaving out, uh, leafing out and when, when the flowers may come into bloom. So it might be a good resource for you to go through here. Um, you can really get lost in this website, by the way. There's a lot of data. So just go in and you know, look around, but be real careful. You might be here for a long time. So this could be a gift, right? If you're interested in this kind of information, especially if you're someone like myself that feeds birds, this is also a nice website to find out when you may want to change seeds and things like that in your feeders. So it's a great resource. So, if we go down to the next slide, I'll show you, if we look at the same development graph again, um, again, that you've seen for bees and mites, and we put onto this graph a good example of when you may put on honey supers if you're going to do some honey production, and how we think about uh, the, the flowers that are available. So let's take a look at that blue line again for the bees. You'll notice for the dormant time period, right, most of the winter, we don't have a ton of material uh, resources at all available for bees, depending on when your winter time period happens. So if they're leaving the colony, they're most likely going on the cleansing flights. They may or may not be able to find something that's popped up in bloom, but for the most part, there's not going to be a really a lot of things out there for them to be able to forge on to make honey. So this might be a time period where you don't have your honey super on hives. 
whereas when you start in the spring, there's a lot more resources that will be coming on and available as the season kicks up. And this may be a time period, depending on where you are and what your interests are, you may want to put on some honey supers. So you've got to think about that, right? As we keep going through the life cycle, that these honey supers in a lot of ways dictate what mite treatments you can use. And we'll, we're going to circle back to that in a minute and remind you that those, there's only a couple of them available to use during honey super times. Um, now, as we keep going through the season, we find that most people during the, the spring, uh, maybe into the summer, and definitely into the fall for parts of our state for sure, people are doing honey supers if they're interested in that, making honey. And the time period of when the honey super may come off or not depends on the beekeeper. So sometimes we see folks going into winter with honey supers on. Sometimes we have people that take them off uh, very quickly. Uh, after the spring and after the fall flows to harvest the honey and obviously we have other folks who don't do any honey supers at all so they may not be interested in in producing honey in that way so maybe they just put one on as needed uh, to add extra space for my treatment so and then of course we end through the rest of the season with getting ready for winter which is the trend what most people don't go into when honey supers on so again all of this you've got to really start thinking about and I know some of you are going, oh my goodness, I didn't know it was going to be this involved to have honeybees. Well, this is not, we don't want to scare you at all. We want to encourage you. And we're, our goal here is to give you as much information as possible so you can be really prepared when you get into this. Uh, because obviously the bees are, are going to develop. And so they're going to be looking to you to help manage uh, their population as, as you've had them as a beekeeper. So let's go to the next slide and we'll keep going through our Vroma plan. But before we get into the rest of it, we wanted to take a quick break and just kind of have a chance to have some questions. So Jen may have some, I always see her with thinking face and I know she's ready. She's got some questions there, so. All right, so let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see, let's see. Oh, okay, I got two questions about reusing or using mite treatments that are left over from the previous year. So we have two people who had leftover treatments. Is it still safe to use those or um, do they lo lower in eff efficacy? I can't never say that word over time. So the first one was ape of our strips and then the other one was formic pro. Yeah, so these are always, especially because it's hard to buy some of these treatments in singles, right? If you've got one hive or two, it's hard. You tend to get a, a box of several and you're like, oh my goodness, what do I do with them now? Um, the thing about treatments and storing them is typically there, there could be some language on the label. They, they usually have a pretty good, pretty good job of putting language like this needs to be stored at X amount of temperature and that kind of thing. So if you feel like you've met those requirements on the label, they should be okay to use as long as uh, the expiration date is still valid. So also these products uh, do have an expiration date on them. Not to say that some products uh, may not be efficacious after the expiration date or if you've let, if you stored them improperly, but just, right, they may not work as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and I remember when we, at the meeting this past year, when we talked with the reps from Apovar, they said that once the packaging is open, that yeah. they don't recommend using those. So um, unfortunately, they uh, they lose their effect their effectiveness <laughs> um, really quickly after they're open. So that might yeah. be one that um, you don't want to reuse. But with the formic acid, um, if you store it properly, like it says on the label, I think that that's that's. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's the key too is storing it properly because I do find a lot of people would just put them in a Ziploc bag and call it a day and throw them wherever and it's like whoa <laughs> you've got to be mindful if you've left them in a really hot car or if you left them you know in your basement or whatever make sure they're stored correctly so um, that's why again I know we say this a lot Jen but you got to do that mite wash after you do a treatment it's the it's yes. the golden ticket so yeah that'll tell you whether it worked or not so, and then I have another question. Um, so this one is, if you see a faint red streaking on pupa that has been uncapped by opening frames, are those mites? If so, if you see more than three, is alcohol test necessary? So I think maybe what they're describing is the intestinal tract inside the bee. Maybe, yeah. I wish, yeah. if this person's got photos, obviously we'd be happy to look at those. Yes. Absolutely, because what you'll see is if you if you open up cappings by accident or you break um, drone drone cappings, you'll see red 
ovals, small red ovals, and those are the mites. But they can also be confused with the eyeballs of the bees. I've seen people send in pictures and say, oh, I have lots of mites, and actually it's the eyeballs, um, the compound eyes of the bees, and so it's not mites. But just also be aware that mites, when they're immature, they're actually see-through-ish to white. So there's a good chance that if you're pulling out pupa, drone pupa, you may not be seeing all of the mites that are there that will be mature by the time that emerges. So yes, I still recommend always doing an alcohol wash. So, great. And uh, we have a whole bunch of questions actually about uh, treating new packages and things that how they've been supplied. And um, maybe we can do that at the next question break because there's like three or four questions along the same or along the same vein. So, so we'll move on for now, and we'll come back to those questions. All right. So, if you had a chance, that actually was a good opportunity too for folks to get this if they were still trying to scramble and download. Um, if not, again, just uh, you could again have just a piece of paper. You can make these little notes real quick. Um, so, if you're following along. We just talked about this, a great timing of when you should monitor for mites. So if we go to the next slide, we're trying to give you a, a more prompts in here to think about this and consider it. Um, we'll show you on the next slide. I just want to be mindful if you if you missed it or if you're just tuning in or uh, that, again, that peak of mite population is going to occur after the peak of the bee population. And this, again, is the biggest hiccup I see with beekeepers trying to figure out how to manage for mites as they tend to think, um, that if the bee population is really high, that means the mite population is going to be at the highest level. And it's not to say that there aren't mites in there, right, when the bee population is high, but they're going to peak because, again, if you think about those two levels of development, uh, that reproductive phase is happening underneath that wax capping. So when those bees emerge, um, the mites are going to come out shortly after that and then go through their life cycle, and that's going to be that peak. So you want to be able to be mindful of that. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to bring back the slides that we showed you before. Um, I know we gave this to you before in a little different format, but we try to make it a little cleaner and easier to see is when should you monitor for mites or sample uh, your hives to get a mite uh, count estimate? And then, of course, when do you know when you should react or, or act in this case? Um, now, for overwintered hives, you can usually wait till early spring um, or spring, depends on your area, and you want to kind of wait until you get a chance to see some food in the hives when the bees are active. I can give you a, kind of an update from RN. We've done several mite treatments for the Massachusetts state, uh, all over the state so far this season, and the mite levels are very low. We're still at a zero to a one uh, mite level per 100 or per 300 bees. So we're very much even less than um, you know, the treatment level, definitely right around the ideal uh, level as far as not even thinking about treatments just yet. So, um, but we're definitely uh, pretty low. Now for packages, thanks, a lot of you are asking your suppliers. That's awesome. I'm really happy to see that. Nukes as well. Um, if they have, a lot of these states require packages to be shook from bees that are treated. So they may have been a treated before arrival. Obviously, if they were not treated, um, you know, then you could have an opportunity here to either take an alcohol wash sample, and obviously this is a package, so this might be a little easier time for you to take a sample if you'd like to do that. Otherwise, we typically um, suggest you guys wait till at least there's some brood after the first month of install, and that gives you a chance to really see what the mite level is. Um, for splits and swarms and cutouts, uh, very similar. So it, obviously if you're splitting a hive, a little different in the sense that you may have controlled uh, mites in the previous hive, we hope you did before you split it, and so you may not want to do anything at install, but if you didn't do that, it might be a good chance to see what the level was before you make a split. Um, and then as far as future monitoring for all of these, monthly at the very least, um, and of course again, after treatment for sure, and I just want to also make sure that we clear up any confusion again about these the threshold levels. I'm really challenging folks with this 1%. I know that that's kind of the minimum. 3% uh, is when the treatment threshold has been reached and that's when you should consider treatments. But that 1%, I, I imagine we're gonna see a lot more scientific research and data starting to push that level as we continue with managing bees and dealing with varroa mites. So uh, really that 1% is ideal. So try to push yourself, I, you can do it. I really, I, I have high hopes for y'all. So we'll go down to the next slide, um, keep going through here, but just wanted to digress again. Um, now, if you are collecting, if you're doing mite, mite washes and, or, and sampling your hives, you're obviously collecting data. 
So if you, we go back to this Honeybee Health Guide, if you look on page 29 at the very end, they give you a great uh, sheet in the guide if you download this to input your data from your mite washes. So it's a great way for you to couple this with the IPM plan information, right? And have these two in your notebook so you can kind of refer back to them, especially if you've done treatments and things like that to see um, if they're actually working and what the mite levels were before and after. So if we go to the next slide, we'll show you um, as you're going through these to think about not only collecting the data on that particular sheet, but also putting it and sharing the data. And also you can see your neighbor's data. So, right, we're only as good as in beekeeping and managing bees as our neighbors. And I don't, I think that's the perfect way to start thinking about this. Um, and I realized, Jen, I may have cut off parts of Maine in this screenshot. That's not cool. Sorry, Maine folks. Cut off half of your state in the screenshot. I got to do a better job. But this is an old screenshot. But the Mic Check website's awesome. They did a new feature this year on Mic Check. Um, also, our partners with this project and added a spring mic count. So you may have seen that notice that went out but recently, but it's definitely a nice way for people to get a head start on this. And of course, anytime you can enter your data, but you'll notice um, you can see right by county what may what some of the mic counts were. So this may be a good way to you for you as well to think about timing your treatments uh, and, and thinking overall what's happening in your local level with mites. All right, let's keep going here. This is getting exciting. We're almost to the end. I'm ready. I'm excited to see what y'all come up with for your IP implants. These are always so fun. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into the tools part, and we're going to elaborate a little bit. We've, we've, we've talked a lot about tools in previous uh, presentations. Um, we've got a few more tidbits of information today for non, so this section, we've labeled it as non-chemical tools. Now, these could be We've also used the word uh, intervention and prevention before. So intervention could fit into the non-chemical tools part of this, um, but we're trying to also give you some new information, especially as you Google and you're out there on the web looking for things. We didn't want you to get stuck if you couldn't find some additional things to, to read about. So when you're thinking about non-chemical tools and we think about that pyramid again that we've showed you a couple times, there are the cultural stuff that you can do. So as a beekeeper, what you're doing to manage your bees, the culture of your beekeeping, the mechanical stuff, so what stuff you can buy in the bee catalog or make and put on or, or in the hives, uh, physical stuff that is non-chemical. And then, of course, uh, genetics. So that would be all the way back in our process of thinking about how your, uh, what, what your bees are doing as far as their hygiene and their genes uh, from the queen. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail in these three sections. These are the things I really want you to ask yourself. You're looking at this column and you're going, okay, Kim, this all sounds great, but what are, what are we talking about? Well, here's the real deal. You need to think, do I need to remove it? If you put something on like physical mechanical part of some sort, am I gonna have time to remove it, right? So that's when you need to think about planning this. Um, if, if this thing doesn't work um, or, or I lose a queen, am I gonna have time to reclean the hive? And then if this thing doesn't work or something happens um, and I split it or whatever, am I gonna have time to build up my hives before winter so they're prepared? So this is a little different challenge, I think, especially for beekeepers in the Northeast. If you're out on the web and you're watching videos, there's some really great ones out there. But if you don't find stuff tailored for the North, that do I have time to build up for winter is really going to come back and be a hard thing to manage. So be mindful when you're watching that stuff. Um, so the options for this section, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some options for you. You may have other things that you're doing. Um, we very much champion your creativity and your ingenuity. So if you've got other things, great. Share with other beekeepers because I'm sure they'd like to learn about them. But these are things like um, thinking about your hive. So physically, the culture of your beekeeping and obviously the equipment you're using, how you space in the apiary, how you set up your apiary, even down to what you paint it. Can you paint it different colors? Can you put things between the hives, uh, you know, hedges or shrubs to help bees orient? Uh, could you even rotate the boxes? So simple stuff about the apiary design itself. And then as we get into the hive, what things can you put on or move around? So this would be like replacing frames, using the screen bottom board, obviously putting in drone frames, um, you know, doing brood interruption. So these are some more of the cultural pieces around, you know, caging your queen or doing things where you can uh, limit the amount of brood or, or interrupt that cycle to reduce the amount of mites. Uh, Requeen your hive, obviously, split it, and then swarm management. So let's go through a couple of these in detail so people have an idea of what we're talking about and give you a little more tips on these sections. So let's go to the next slide. So these are the cultural, mechanical, and genetic stuff. Um, the tools that we're mentioning here, 
uh, some are the, the intervention pieces, right? And some are also in the prevention piece, but most of the prevention stuff has to do with chemical use. So, uh, but obviously some of these could also prevent mites in, in these ways. But for the most part, we're talking about intervention and physical things you can do to either the apiary and or the bee stock that you're, you're managing. So reducing transmission. So the design of the apiary and the population density of your hives. This is the stuff that we were mentioning earlier about painting your hive, rotating the entrance. You can see you're putting a shrub in between them. Um, there is a, some work out there and suggestions about keeping hives small. So, you know, this obviously is not meant to be uh, the exactly what you should do. These are all recommendations. So you may not be a beekeeper that's interested in keeping your hive small, but the idea here is that if you have a smaller hive, that you would have obviously a, a greater chance to control rural mites because you'd be able to manage that a little bit easier and also potentially have a smaller population of bees. So, but you know, again, this may not be something that you're interested in, but it's an option. Genetic wise, this really starts at the beginning level. So for people who just got packages, you may not have much control over this at the immediate moment, but you can definitely start putting some control as those bees develop. So this will be stuff about queen stock. So for instance, you could, if you're interested, if the weather is not great where you are, but we're warming up into it, and you've just installed a package, you could requeen it. So if you wanted to try a different type of bee, um, and we'll show you some examples of different types of queens. Now granted, as a beekeeper, guess what? You just got honeybees, you're going to now be, have to become a swarm managing warrior. That is your next task. Not only are you going to have to figure out how to manage for the rural mites, but bees are going to swarm. It is their natural reproductive duty, it is their instinct, and they're going to do it. So you got to figure out how you want to manage this. And the way that you manage it can really be beneficial and also helping you control varroa. So if you don't manage this at all, not only are you giving bees away for free, which is if that's what you want to do, awesome. But I'm not sure that your neighbors would appreciate that, depending on where you live, if those bees end up in places they don't want them to be. And also, it might create a lot of problems for you as a beekeeper if you've got a really great queen and you lose her because she swarms. So it would behoove you real quick to, to do a Google search or get some good books out there on swarm management, because that's going to be your first big task uh, for the management aspect of spring starts. Now, the other stuff on the side here for social immunity we want to just introduce this topic and we're not going to talk a ton about it, but we at least want to give you some ideas and bigger picture ideas for your apiary. Now, obviously, for just getting bees, some of these things may not work right away in the sense that you may not have old frames to swap out yet, especially if you just got a package and you have brand new equipment. Um, if you're getting a nuke, typically those contain older frames and you may want to wait to obviously swap those out until the, the fruit is developed on them. But that could be an option for you to even do possibly this season, depending on how you manage your bees. There's a, actually a pretty good amount of literature coming out, which is really exciting about leaving propolis. So propolis is a really interesting substance. It's obviously, I'm going to say interesting intentionally because some beekeepers hate this <laughs> and it's the bane of their existence. It's the stuff that's left on your clothes and your hive tools and your car steering wheel and your seats when you work bees. It's a sticky resin that bees collect, um, typically from trees. And this material is also used as a barrier uh, inside of the hive for increasing immunity um, and helping with these um, uh, biotic organisms in their gut and, and basically like an envelope in the hive to help them. Um, but it also can be really hard as you're working bees. There is some work that's coming out that suggests that if you increase propolis or if you have bees that produce high levels of this, that it may actually help with their immunity and therefore obviously help them be healthier. So there's some real good suggestions around having hives or, or keeping hives in your apiary that do large amounts of propolis production. And then we talked a lot about screen bottom. So let's squeeze through and we'll go through a couple of these because some of this is new and we want to at least give you a little bit of information for those uh, that are just hearing about this for the first time. So we talked a little bit about the, the apiary design. Um, the goal here, at least some of the common suggestions, is to keep the, the control the drift from the hives and, and keeping the hive spaced out a little bit. So either creating a barrier so bees can go back to their original hive um, and not have so much of a complication trying to find that and orient to that. So it could be something like spacing your hive 10 feet apart is what the suggestion is. Keeping them on separate hive stands, right? So you don't have a, a real big uh, confusion for bees trying to return. Paint them, um, provide a barrier like this shrub. Um, and then you can also real easily just face the, the entrances in different directions. So a lot of you probably have really fantastically painted elaborate hives. So I find a lot of beekeepers do a great job uh, with doing something 
uh, even personal on their hive. So I've got some beekeepers that name them. I've got some beekeepers that have these beautiful murals. There should be art book, Jen, about what hives are painted. It would be awesome. Maybe there is one and I missed it. Share it with me, by the way, if you're out there listening to this and you know of a book that has uh, hive paintings, I would love to have that on the coffee table. But yeah, so beekeepers do, uh, for, for the most part, controlling drift with physical things that you can do. Uh, they're doing, you're doing a pretty good job doing this. I find that for the most case. The robbing is a little harder, and this is a hard one to think about, but what we want you to do for robbing is to come up with ways to reduce it. So here's some suggestions. Monitor for your hive for strength. Obviously, a stronger hive uh, has an uh, ability to rob out a weaker hive. So if you've got some hives that are really struggling, then they become a victim really quickly. So if you keep your apiary fairly equalized and you do a good job of maintaining that, you'll reduce the, the propensity of this pretty quickly. This, the hive small, this may not fit everybody's this uh, apiary goal, so I'm still going to keep it on here because some people really like this idea, whether it's physically easier for them because they can physically, you know, lift the boxes easier, or if it's a, a situation where they do see the benefits of keeping uh, much smaller hives. And then opening, uh, sorry, feeding bees in open air. Um, some of your states may even have laws that are uh, do not allow bees to be fed in open air. So these would be things like putting a feeder in the middle of your apiary and letting bees come to that and feed um, open. So without putting something inside of a hive. And obviously the benefits to that are, are great because it's easier for the beekeeper. You can feed a lot of bees at once, but right when you create a, a situation where bees are, are interacting with each other in a small space, you're also creating a situation where they can exchange mites, where they can obviously exchange other health conditions and issues that you may not want to be sharing in apiary. And uh, you, typically create a situation where robbing can occur uh, fairly quickly and then you've got a lot more problems you got to deal with. So, yeah, just don't open air feed bees. The other thing is that leaving equipment exposed. So similar to the open air feeding, you don't just want to leave a honey super in the middle of an apiary unexposed in the sense that, uh, you know, bees will also rob that as well and it creates typically a greater uh, propensity for the rest of the bees to start robbing. And then damaged equipment, we're talking about when you have equipment that has little holes in the side or maybe the boxes don't line up and you know, they're just kind of deteriorating over time. Those create a lot more opportunities for bees to have easier access to the hive and, and harder for the bees that are working with the hive to, to control the entrance and, and guard those. So if you've got a little hole or a series of holes, you know, just go around and clean that up or maybe it's time to get some new hive boxes. So, yeah, it's time. You got plenty of time to build them now, right? So, all right. So, Let's go through the next slide and we'll show you a couple more tips about social immunity. And we're really talking about hive hygiene here. So this is a tough one. I see beekeepers struggle a lot with thinking about hive hygiene. So um, the comb is what we're specifically interested in as far as replacing it. And we talked a little bit about how you could do that. If you've got a nuke, maybe you want to wait a little, little while. Obviously, if you've got a new package, that's not really something you want to do right now if they're just building out on new equipment. But if you do, uh, you know, a couple of seasons from now, if you have some comb that's really dark and old and you can tell just a very dark color, um, then you'll know those are the, that's the frames you want to target. And we recommend doing that every three to five years. And um, we're not saying replace them all at one time, but just cycle out the replacement of bees so you have as much fresh comb as possible. Um, you know, it's, it's good real estate for bees to have healthy material to use to put in their brood and, and have a hive management. The other thing is, right, replacing broken damage frames. So those could go into the system of which one should you replace, the old ones and the damaged and broken ones, or the ones where bees made funky comb on. You know, they didn't draw this out correctly, or there's a big hole here, or there's a gape uh, they go through. So those are the ones you want to target. We do, we definitely want to discourage you. Do not, do not purchase and, and alternately sell, really use equipment, um, because this is where you can get a lot of problems into your apiary unknowingly. And oftentimes, you know, no harm intended on either side, but this can this come with a lot of issues. And a good example is an American Valbrood, which the spores can last on wax and old equipment for a very long time. So if you purchase this, uh, even if the beekeeper or you feel like you've cleaned it properly, we find that's often not the case. So we just want to discourage you from doing that. The other thing is that do not rotate your equipment in the boxes in the apiary without some sort of record. 
I see uh, sometimes that beekeepers will label their boxes, which is great. You know, this is hive one, and this is box one, this is, you know, that kind of thing. But if you're just moving stuff around and you've got an issue, especially right when it comes to mite levels, then you may be transferring a problem as you move those different pieces around. So just be real careful if you're rotating or need extra equipment. You know, you're not just playing musical chairs every week with these boxes. So be real intentional about how you move them. We talked about the propolis. Um, and then, of course, the screen bottom boards, obviously a great way for, for you to get a little extra mic drop. And then the drone brood frames. So this is thrown in there because we don't want you to, drone brood frames are the best laid plans for a beekeeper. You purchase them, they're you know, bright colored, you're going to have all the good intentions of putting them in and monitoring and managing them. And the next thing you know, your hive has turned into a drone nursery and all these drones are emerging. And then, of course, comes all the mics that come with them. And so, you know, while we, we don't want to discourage you in using drone brood frames, we want to encourage you to use them properly. So there's a lot of tools out there available for them as far as use. Um, and if you have a hard time killing bees, uh, you know, we, Jen has talked about this before in webinars, uh, you can feed them to the chickens. So it can be like, a, you know, put it down there and walk away, you know, <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. Um, but yeah, we're happy to help you answer questions about this. While I, I do love bees in general, and I think drones are obviously adorable, we do not want to encourage you to become a drone brood nursery. Please make mistakes. So, yeah. All right, let's keep going. Um, what do we got here for you as far as uh, genetics? This is a really a good area, especially if you're thinking about queen. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because there, there's a really great section, and I'll point to the next slide in a resource uh, for you. But we're talking about what I call varroa warriors. So these are different types of queens that have been bred and have been selected to show some level of fight against Varroa, whether it's, you know, some resistance in some way um, and not completely resistant. So this is not a one-stop shop. If you've purchased Russian bees or Russian packages, that does not mean that you do not have to manage for Varroa mites. It just means you have another tool in your toolkit for mite management. So it doesn't make you immune. The same goes with these uh, VSH, uh, varroa sensitive hygienic queens or ankle biters and again we'll, on the next slide in just a minute we'll show you some other examples and additional information if you want to find out more about these. The other thing as far as queens go you don't feel like you need to purchase you know a fancy queen you could just do something very simple in your apiary by being mindful about and very selective about what queens you would like to have. So obviously you have one hive this may be a little harder right now if you're doing this for the first time this season but as you go through and as you think about splitting that hive or not splitting that hive, um, you know, think real intentional about what traits you would like to get out of that queen, right? So if she's a high propolis producer, if the hive makes a lot of propolis, maybe that's a queen you want to think about keeping in your apiary. If they have a real high survival uh, for winter, that's another great tra trait that you want to keep in the apiary. If they have a really high grooming behavior, which means that they're able to uh, do a good job of removing mites off the bees themselves and or uh, opening up the brood cells of drones or other bees developing uh, when they have a high mite level, therefore disrupting the mite cycle. Um, or maybe they just always have a very low varroa mite count in general. So those are all things you want to be thinking about and maybe notes that you're writing on the back of this IPM plan of things to look for while you're managing your bees and make a note of that. You know, if you go through your hive and you go, oh, wow, this hive is awesome. This queen is so great. She's got this, this, and this. I really love that about her. Make some notes on top, you know, even on the top of the hive if you can. Um, and that way you'll remember it next time. So if you think about splitting or grafting, if you get to that, that part in your apiary and you want to start managing, producing your own queens, you can select that hive. The other things that we, we sort of talked about in general, right, of, of splitting and being intentional with those, um, managing swarms, uh, also from the, from the end of if you have a swarm that comes into your apiary or if you have an opportunity to collect a swarm in your area, there's a real big misconception I find that people say, oh, swarms are the most healthy bees, they have the lowest mite loads, they're like the cream of the crop primo, you know, we want to get that swarm, plus of course they're free, so, but it's not always the case. I've found that swarms, uh, and that goes with cutouts as well, and, and other hives that aren't in your traditional lake straw hive box as part of your original apiary, don't always have low varroa mite count. So be careful if you get and collect these things that, that you have to go through and check. Um, and then, of course, just one last little tip about if you do have a uh, problem in the apiary and you've got a couple of these hives that seem to be weak or declining, 
it's not a good idea to combine them, especially late in the season. I see this happen real often, um, actually and also in the spring, where folks will say, oh, my hive came out of winter and it seems to be struggling a little bit. I'm going to combine it with my other hive that's doing really great. Well, there's probably a reason that hive is not doing great coming out of winter, and that's not something you want to cultivate in the apiary. So troubleshoot what's going on first, and then you can make a good decision. All right, thank you for my soapbox. That's my soapbox real quick. Jen, you want to add anything to those? Um, nope. I don't want to go into this in great detail except to show you that's available, and it's in the uh, Cornell's really fantastic integrated pest management that we also show you the, uh, the, the IPM triangle from several page guide, but it's really great. If you have this guide and you've got the Honey Bee Health Coalition guide and you've got our table mite management, then you are set. So yeah, these are great, but this will go into all the different types of queens that are available that you can uh, look for if you're interested in purchasing a queen or even purchasing bees from some of these stocks. So this might be a little late for some people who bought bees this season, but something to think about, right, as you manage your bees this season, if you want to bring a queen in, um, or you want to purchase bees next season. All right, let's keep going here. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, questions. All right, woo. All right, we have a bunch of questions. So um, two people asked about splitting, and I know you just covered it, so maybe there's nothing more to cover, but um, someone said, can you cover splitting uh, strong over winter colonies for IPM planning? And someone else said, could you speak about using splits to combat mites? I split my hives twice last year, and the mite counts have never been lower. Is this enough, or am I foolish for skipping over? types of treatment, I want to think long, ter long term. Jen's like, nope, okay. I will always wait to see if Jen goes first. Okay, because um, she's, yeah, she's my guru. Um, okay, so splitting, yes, I really, I think splitting, especially as you're going into the season, is a great way to manage mites. The key to splitting, and we mentioned it earlier, is that you can't split from a hive uh, and assume that the splitting alone was the only thing that you needed to do to maintain a low mite level. If you have a hive that had a real high mite level and you split it, guess what? The new hive is probably going to have a real high mite level. So you got to be real mindful of doing a mite count before you do the split. Again, be really selective in that. Um, if you have one hive right now, that may not be an opportunity for you to be really selective unless you choose that that's not a great looking hive and you know, development. But if you've got a couple, you have a lot of more real estate to choose from and how you want to split. So be really stringent. Um, and this is hard because I know people, we really love our bees and we love our queens especially, and we form a personal attachment to them. And I totally get it. Listen, I totally get it. But you have to be real careful to not let that cloud your judgment of being a good beekeeper. So be rigid with this. Um, yeah. Jen, you got anything else about splitting? Maybe I didn't answer the question either. We get, we'll talk, we're going to actually, actually talk about a manage and a split hive uh, a little later, how to create a plan for it. So. Okay. All right. So we've had a few questions about um, uh, packages arriving at this time of year. So uh, one person said she has a very weak package, and the supplier said um, that they treat it in the fall. Can she wait for them uh, to get stronger before the alcohol roll? And I'll just scroll down because I know there were a couple more questions. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I am not seeing it right now. There's actually some about temperature. Um, uh, so, but, but can you answer that question about um, what to do with a with a week uh, with a uh, a week package? Jen's gonna yeah. start talking. <laughs> I, I always, it's like the gentleman in me. I always wait. So. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sad that you got a weak package. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I know that's face. the sad part. Um, yeah, I would, I would wait a little bit um, to, um, to, to let it build up a little bit um, before you did it. But I mean, weak is, if you had, I mean, 50% of the bees were dead in there. Um, that's also a problem that you might want to bring up with your supplier. Um, if there's a little bit of dead bees in the bottom and it's, it was a, you know, a pretty good package or a decent package still, you could have done a mite wash right out of the, out of the package. But if it is weak, I would, I would baby it a little bit and then, and then check. So. Great. Uh, somebody else said, um, 
uh, if you know research on vaping versus fogging of oxalic acid, does fogging have proper research and our data anywhere? Because they haven't been able to find it. All right. So these are my favorite questions because uh, fogging is illegal. It's not an appropriate, it's not a, a, a way to, it's not a, um, it's not a way legally to apply um, oxalic acid in the United States. So there has there hasn't really been testing on it. There's there's a couple research studies out there, but um, unfortunately, they don't yield positive results. It's it's a little bit too those. It's a little too variable. You don't get a, a reliable treatment that way. Um, plus, it's illegal, so you shouldn't be doing it. There was another question about blue shop towels with glycerin also an illegal application of oxalic acid um, and you shouldn't be doing it. The research is, the EPA is, is doing some testing on that right now. The research shows promise in some areas, but not all areas. It seems like in places where it's more humid, that's not a reliable method for um, applying and does not work. And it also depends a lot on, the, re the results they're getting depends a lot on size of the hive. So if it's a smaller hive, they seem to be getting better coverage than larger hives. Um, and so it's it's not reliable yet, but there is testing going on in that and it might be an approved method with some more testing through the EPA. Um, but both of those methods are not legal in the United States. So fogging, no. Glycerin, shop towels, no. Okay. And then a couple of people have been asking questions about temperature. So Mark Lechner said, it's too cool here in Southern Maine to open the hives for a mite check. I cleaned the bottom boards last week and checked three days later, saw no mites. Is this acceptable mite check until I can open the hives? Um, and Janice Perrin had a similar question. What temperature do you suggest for a full inspection? I was going to do it on Sunday, but the temperature and the temperature was supposed to be in the 60s, but it didn't get that high and I thought it was too cold and damp. So a few, and there was another question along the same lines. Oh, yeah. right. I was, I was I think Je this is what Jen and I do all day long, by the way, everybody. So we, we, we are in our element right now. We're like comedians in a comedy. So, yeah. um, okay. So uh, as far as temperature goes, we always recommend, uh, okay, so let me back up. There's two elements to this question. The first is, is the hive in full sun or is it in the shade? Because those would be a little bit different. But the other question is, um, as far as temperatures, there's the daylight temperatures, right? And then the nighttime temperatures for my treatment. So let's talk about the opening inspection part of it. If the hive is in full sun, we typically recommend that beekeepers wait until the temperature is at least 50 degrees, ideally 55 degrees. However, you may still see bees flying uh, much lower temperatures than that. But just be mindful, if it's not at least 50 degrees external temperatures, uh, you know, you may cause damage to the brood. And so even if bees are flying. So that's a good good rule of thumb. Uh, really and no always, wind. And no, no wind. wind. Yes, yes, yes. So 55 is kind of my personal favorite, but if they're in full sun, you can, you can skate by 50. So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now, oh, sorry, as far as mite treatment, oh, let's answer that part of it. So the mite treatment question is tough. Um, just based on what we're seeing this year, again, in Massachusetts, we're seeing really low rural mite levels for overwintered hives. So uh, it does not seem to, so far, what we've seen and what we've been able to test is bees have not filled up to the level yet where they required uh, a treatment in the sense that they haven't reached that threshold. However, if you would like to check, which obviously we're still doing, alcohol washes here and checking for that, um, you can, uh, if, and if it does seem like you need a treatment, you can put a treatment on the external temperature component. Uh, typically, there's some products you can use, by the way, for low temperatures, and actually, it's a good segue into the next part of this, but if the, if the minimum temperature is needed is, say, for us to 60 degrees and it gets 30 degrees at nighttime, you're probably not going to have as efficacious of a treatment, uh, obviously, if you would, if it's much, much warmer. So just be real careful. If you're getting one mite, it's not a time for you to think about treatment. But if you're getting 20, you know, <laughs> you definitely, well, number one, they probably won't make it anyways. But if you do, you know, want to do a treatment, it's worth, it's a Hail Mary. So, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so it's uh, 20 past two. We're scheduled to finish at 2.30. Um, so we will probably run over and I'm given the, given the circumstances that we're all watching this from home, I'm gonna, actually gonna suggest that Kim does not race through the next section in a few minutes, but um, um, we will we'll, we'll go over, to, over a little bit of time today. So 
Um, and for those of you who need to jump off because you have other things scheduled, this is being recorded, so you can come back and, and watch that. I think it's better for us to, uh, to, to, to do a good job for you than race through it just for, for time's sake. So, okay. Yes, okay. So, sorry sorry for everybody, by the way, for running over. I would love to say that it's the first time it's ever happened, but Jen and I have that happen a lot, probably, in our world. We love talking about bees, so thanks for humoring us. Um, so, let's talk about chemical tools, and this is where I think where your IPM plan is the most critical as far as really considering all the different aspects, and we talked about some of this, actually, with some of the questions, so we won't dwell on it too much, but just some questions to ask yourself, right? Again, we want to come back. So, what's the temperature going to be, you think? What's the population going to be? And you probably filled that out, right, in this, the first part of this. Um, do you need it to, to penetrate the brood capping? So are you going to apply a treatment, or do you feel like you want to target, or you're going to need to target a time where maybe the most amount of mites in the hive are going to be underneath those capping? So that's something to think about, right, because there's only one product or group of products available for that. Um, will the honey supers be on? Um, again, so only certain products can be used for honey supers. How long is the treatment going to last? And is that going to conflict with anything you're doing? Um, specifically, thinking about honey supers, or if you're thinking about splitting, or if you're thinking about rearing queens, or getting ready for winter, you got to think about that because the treatments aren't put them on one day and take them off the next day. You know, some of these things have very long treatment time periods. Um, you know, do you need special equipment? If you're putting on treatments that need some sort of ventilation, do you have a, a you know, some sort of a spacer? Do you have a super? Or do you have a way to provide that extra ventilation? Um, again, we're going to go back to about that question of requeening. So some of these treatments may do a number on your queen. So if you use them at certain times of the year, you may not have an opportunity to requeen. And then obviously, if you, um, if you need to retreat, if the treatment was not efficacious for whatever reason, are you going to have time to do that to keep the mite level low? So those are all the things you got to be thinking about. And I know it seems like a lot, but as you start filling this out, you're going to notice, right? It might be a lot of scribbles in the first one, but you'll start figuring out how this may work for you. So here are the options you're going to see on the sample plans. Uh, basically six groups of chemicals. Um, obviously, by the way, Quick Strix and Formic Pro are separate products, but the active ingredient is still formic acid. So let's scroll through here. And just a real quick reminder, if you haven't watched the other webinars, what things are available to you. As far as safety goes, these are the options available. Uh, the two with the X's on them, there was a question about that earlier too. Um, they are available and they are approved for use, for instance, in Massachusetts, they're registered for use as products, but they've been shown to have mite resistance. So although they are available, just be mindful if you use them that they may not be as efficacious on the mites. The other thing I wanna really draw your attention to are the products that need a respirator. So there was an error on a previous slide of this. Um, there was a formic acid and the formic pro was listed. Those two products do not require a respirator. So thank you uh, to the beekeeper that reached out to me. So that was an error, but these two products do. So anything with oxalic acid and anything um, obviously with the apel uh, product name would require you to have a respirator. Now, granted, we totally understand right now that you may have a hard time getting this protective equipment, but I do not think that you should forego this um, because you cannot access it. So if you have real constraints and you are wanting to run by some suggestions of what you think you can find or if you need help in finding things, uh, you know, reach out to us and we will either put you in contact with the folks that we know that can help you support you or we can help, you know, look at if you send us photos or whatever, we can help you to troubleshoot this. So I, I get that this might be hard, but please, 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 for the health of you and your bees, do not do this stuff without the proper safety equipment, y'all. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and actually, there's two more here for you. So this is a temperature one for all the questions about temperature. So the things that required, um, basically don't have a temperature requirement would be the oxalic acid group, the hop guard group. So those are the hop uh, beta acid. Uh, active ingredient, and then Apivar, uh, which is an, an Amitraz product. So those are the ones that you can pretty much apply in most temperatures or have a very low temperature threshold, less than 50. The ones that have to be 50 or greater, um, in addition to those that don't have a temperature threshold, are also listed in this section. So those are pretty much everything else. So if you're in spring right now, and we're in and out of temperature availability to meet these criteria, then you might be really limited on what you can use. So just be mindful. All right, so we'll keep going here. The last thing is the honey supers. So this is a very easy one for you to remember. There's only two products you can apply with honey supers. That would be the hot guard product, our uh, products, two or three, and then the formic, formic acid products, Mitoid Quick Strips or Formic Pro. 
Everything else cannot be applied with honey supers. And I'll go one step further and just one last reminder plug. If you have yet to get your package of bees and you want to apply a mic product at install, the only products that you can use for packages of bees are HopGuard 2 and 3 or oxalic acid. And you can see that little uh, spray bottle down there for that product that you can apply. So those are the only two registered for package of bees if you would like to apply treatment on the package of bees. Okay, so enough of that. Let's get through some of the sample plans for you. Now, these are examples, what you're going to see on these plans and how they're filled in. And again, you may be filling yours in totally different. These are all examples for you to use and think about. Nothing here is concrete. Nothing here is rigid. If, like everything in beekeeping, it's all plastic and available for you as you need to make changes. But you're going to see these terms in each of these sections. And I just wanted to throw them out so you can sort of understand how we have thought about this and give you some examples. All right, so let's go to the next, uh, or the first example that we're going to show you. Um, oh, wait, before we do that, I'll show you what they should not look like. So this is from our workshop. You'll notice the, the handouts are here different because we've got like a mic threshold column. Um, well, we, we gave you that several slides ago, so we didn't feel the need to add that in. We wanted to put some more space in there for you to consider other things. Overall, you can see this person was trying, but if you fill this out and this is your version uh, later on, this is not going to mean much to you. So, you know, <laughs> be real careful how you're filling these out. I'll give you another example if you go to the next slide. Um, this one's got a little bit more information if you scroll down to the next one. Right, a little bit, oop, oop, go back. <laughs> Sorry, Yana. All right, so this one's got a little bit more information, but it still may not mean much to you. It probably meant a lot, right, when this was being prepared to the person, but it is, may not mean a lot when you go to look at this three or four months from now. So I just want to caution you if you're doing something like this, if you create a system, you know, are those pluses or those X's? Am I using that? Am I not using that? I don't even know what that means. So just if you create a system, make sure that you have some way to understand uh, what it means later on. But overall, you can see they started thinking about how to do my treatments and when you should put them on. They're missing um, some of the pieces in here, but it's, 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 we're getting better. So let's show you one that I really, obviously, we put some thought into. If you go to the next slide, and this is a, again an example. So go down one more slide. Um, there we go. Okay, so at the top, you can see this is our 2020. This happens to be our mite management plan, by the way, for one of our state apiary locations in Amherst. So our state manages two apiary locations for providing outreach education to beekeepers as part of our educational efforts with the program. And we actually had a really great overwintering success this year of 85%. So we have a lot of hives um, and all the ones are overwintered. So this is a good example to show you. A lot of stuff on this page, so you might want to go back and rewatch this later or if you're taking your notes. Um, the themes I want to start with, so let's start with the colony inspection timeline and then once we go through this one, you'll sort of see how they change in the next ones. So obviously these are overwintered hives. Um, if you have over overwintered hives, this is a great example for you to think about using. That's not the only thing you can do, but um, depends on your weather. For instance, in Massachusetts, we've opened the hives. Uh, we did an external check last week. We opened, or sorry, last month, we opened them in March as much as we could, but very sparingly. Whereas this month, we really got into them. We did mite washes. We could check and see uh, what made it through the winter, how they're developing. And then from here on out, based on our, our apiary schedule, we typically plan either a monthly opening whenever there's not a lot of development or we don't need to do any sort of drill management like take honey supers on or off. And then we do our bi-monthly opens whenever we feel like the population is gonna be at a very high level and or we may need to either manage for swarming or help you know, with honey supers on and off. You know, that's why we you see the language there. Uh, or we're preparing them for winter, right? We're putting on some sort of winter covering or mouse collar or something like that. So the population is what we're, we'll see. This is a good estimate for this year, what we're seeing so far. Um, March, we had a dormant to increase, actually a fairly a big boom increase in population. And we're seeing an increase fairly nicely now. I imagine this, it depends on the weather and the plants available, we may continue to see this throughout the rest of the season. And typically we'll peak for these overwintered hives um, later in July, depending on weather, definitely through August and even sometimes extending into September and then we'll start our decrease in population. Now that obviously coincides with the honey flow. Now for our operations at the state, we are not a business, so we don't sell honey, but all the honey we produce typically gets donated to food banks. 
So we're able to, have to provide that, which is awesome to a local community. But um, granted, we're only doing honey supering because, uh, you know, obviously bees collect honey and we wanted to provide this resource. So, but this may differ, right, if you're not interested in producing honey. So, and when the supers are available, depends a lot about when the bloom is available. And actually for us specifically, our honey supering um, is very closely tied to when we can do mite treatments. So we will not put on honey supers just like you should be doing in your apiary, but very intentionally, I'll even wait or stagger that if we need to put on a mite treatment, especially if we've got real or populous hives. So you'll see some of the question marks in here. And at, that, at this point, I'm not really sure yet, right, how much honey we're going to get for the season, but I've got a little question mark that looks sort of placeholder to remind you to think about that and remind the team. So my monitoring is fairly standard, right? Monthly, pre and post treatment. So every month we're gonna at least monitor. Every month if we do a treatment, we're gonna monitor before and after. Non-chemical tools. So we're a little bit more rigid in the state apiary when it comes to these. And the only reason we are is because we have very limited time to manage the apiary. So you're not gonna see as many options in this section that you could put in as a beekeeper managing your own bees, right? So we have several hives, we have a very busy schedule and we may not be able to go out and take on and, and take off as many parts as we would need or do some of these cultural pieces. Um, also the apiaries have already been set up. So we've got a little bit of flexibility regarding spacing and, and uh, hive stands and stuff like that, but not a ton. So we were able to do a little bit of the other stuff, which is like removing the entrances around or, you know, making sure that we uh, put as the, the smaller hives of the other side of the apiary. So those are kind of the bigger pieces that you don't see technically on this, this page. Yet. But the screen bottom boards are on all the hives. They stay on year round. Um, we do rotate the entrances. We do change out the frames. We do requeen. We split. We swarm manage. So all of those are all the pieces that are available. And actually you'll see at the end for August and September, we also do some combines. So we will combine hives as needed if they are, uh, you know, if we've split them, right, and the split did not, was not able to really build up enough for the winter, that's some of that winter management coming in. We'll do a combo, but again, only the hives that are healthy and not any hives that are weak. And so we need to get them prepared to be large enough for winter. Um, also, if, if the queen is, is not doing that great or if she's doing really great, we might be real selective on requeening and or combining those hives. So. Now for the chemical tools, um, in the state apiaries, typically we start out the season, if we don't have honey supers on in May, again, that's why you see those question marks with the April IFR and the honey super for May, we will put on a thymol based product, the April IFR product that has a very long treatment time period. So it gives us a chance to get into the apiaries. Uh, the hives are usually very large, big population, put on the thymol real quick, knock them down for the start of the season. And then typically for us, we don't put on a mite treatment in June, in the past, we haven't seen a need for that. Well, obviously we could, so we would respond, but we will typically start if we've got a lot of honey supers going into July and August, we will typically pull out right our, our honey super tool and also our under the mic capping tool, which is the formic acid, so the mitolipid strips, the formic pro products. If we don't have honey supers on in August, we go straight into Apigar. So we bring into an additional tool into the apiary. Um, and then we'll go into an oxalic acid dribble. We do not use vapor in the apiary because we don't have the equipment. Um, and then of course, if the, if the uh, oxalic acid dribble is not doing a good enough job to knock it down, we'll pull out the really big product and use vapor bar for that late season, big knockdown before we go into winter. This process of chemical tools and non-chemical tools management has worked really well for us in this space. So again, examples, uh, of things that you can do. This may not be all that you can do, but keep in mind as you're filling this out, you want to you want to keep be mindful of whether you have honey supers on the hive, whether there's going to need to be something that penetrates the cappings, right? Do you need to use formic acid? Going to have enough brood for that? And, and if this affects my queen, am I going to have enough time to to make some corrections in the apiary and get ready for winter? Um, the other thing I just want you to be mindful of is as you're doing these and creating the guides is, is that again, you have the proper protective equipment. So this year, this might change it considerably, right? If we aren't able to get respirators and things like that. So um, we'll have to see how this works out. But in general, this has been the plan. So good example for an overwinter half. So let's show you some examples for packages. That was a hot question in here. All right, so here's a package example. Very quickly, you will see a lot of NAs on this sheet. The reason is because these are packaged bees. 
and they obviously, unlike the other winter hives, don't have access to, in most, most cases, the comb that's available that's drawn out for them to use. So they've got to do a lot of work at the beginning of this developmental cycle. Um, so you see a lot of, you know, holes here. Also, the bigger piece is waiting. You'll notice if we go, again, start on the, the colony inspection area, we're going to wait for the first month before we open the hive, give them a chance to build out some comb. Obviously, the colony population depends on if you get your package in April. Some of our beekeepers get them in March, so this may shift up for you. Um, and actually, some get them in May, so this may shift down a little bit. But just the example for us, uh, for most of the packages this year coming into April um, and May. But you'll see a colony increase, and fairly for the most, for a big portion of the month, a little bit more than kind of a, a little slower trickle of an increase than what you see, obviously, in an overwinter hive that has full comb available. We're still opening them monthly though as that copulation is increasing and, and going through the development because we want to be able to again keep really good checks on what's happening in the hive. The honey flow however, um, this may not be an area where you want to put on honey supers. So there should be some questions here, uh, or should be some question marks, there could be some question marks for you. They're not on this, this page because I left the honey supers on if you're going to use my treatments that need that extra bit of ventilation. So if, for instance, if you use Formic Pro, it does need a little bit of extra ventilation, so they ask you to call on some extra equipment or a spacer. So if you have an extra super or you got the super with your setup when you purchase the bees, this might be a great opportunity for you to put that on. So, but, so maybe you're not using this, right, to actually collect honey, but you're using it more of a spacer. Also, the real big discouragement in beekeeping is to have new beekeepers with packages, not just go honey, in uh, intense and just only focus on honey production right off the gate and give bees a chance to build up and also build up their own stores. And so you may not get any honey or very little honey out of a new package. So that may not be your real big push this year. And then mite monitoring is very similar to before. Once the bees build up, this coincides with the population level and the inspection time. You want to do that every month. And then obviously the non-chemical tools available to you, right, as a new beekeeper with a new hive are, are open, endless. So you know, you've got all the equipment, you've got opportunities to put in all kinds of stuff. So drone frames, for instance, you can obviously do the swarm management, you need to be doing, if you, well, you could be doing screen bottom boards, is that something you want to be doing? Um, the time of when you do some of the actual physical, the cultural methods of taking the queen and doing splits or recleaning or caging her is going to be quite a bit delayed as the season continues, right, because the bees are developing. So you've got to wait till you have enough fruit to be able to do those things, and obviously the mite's going to increases the brood increases and, and obviously the biggest peak is after that so you want to wait to do some of that stuff uh, not right out of the gate and maybe you don't do a ton of that even in the first season it's up to you it also depends how they develop so there's just suggestions here now the chemical tools are also a wide open door for you so you could use oa spray right you could do the, the oxalic acid spray when you do them an install if the supplier didn't treat and you want to have a a good start of the treatment. You could also use hop guards. So we talked about those for packages. Um, we typically suggest you to wait to do not only the mite wash, but also to apply any treatments until you get a really good uh, opportunity to have brood. So we want you to wait a little bit of time. So you've got some brood, you've got enough bees to do a mite wash or a roll. You could sample, right, get a number, find out what your level is. And then if you're using honey supers, you got to keep in mind what's available to you. So that may only be something like Right away quick strips or if you want to use the hop guard if you didn't use it before so those would be the only products if you're not using honey supers and you have a real high mite level you're pretty much the, the window is open as long as the temperature is there for you so this just may change a lot so you can see some other good examples apigard as you go through the season for a late late season treatment and then of course apivar you'll notice a trend with the apivar we see a lot of beekeepers prefer this product as a late season treatment because it is a does a pretty good heavy hitting of the mite levels. Um, it also has a fairly long treatment period. So it's kind of one that you can put in and leave it. Sometimes even through the winter, they don't get a chance to take it out before they can no longer open bees due to the weather. Um, the other thing you'll see on here that you can do, and I want to bring your attention to this for the December, January, uh, for in February treatments, is you could do an OA vape during the winter. And we've seen more and more beekeepers doing this during the winter. It's very easy for them to do in a sense. They just stick the vaporizer in the hive entrance. They can do it. It's immediate. They can see the mic drop. So that's another great tool to think about. Um, and possibly an OA dribble if the temperature is okay. But be careful with that because you don't want to damage the fruit. So 
Here's a good example for packages. I know there's a lot here. So again, you might want to refer back to this, but again, some good opportunities as examples. So let me show you some of the folks have done during the workshops that have submitted to us. I'll start out by one of my favorite ones. And I promise you, we're almost done for people who are hanging in there. Thank you for hanging in with us. Um, so this is a package one, uh, a little different format, but the same idea as far as when you're thinking about planning. And you'll notice I really like this uh, because the person has left themselves, again, a lot of space. They've given a lot of options. Uh, they've thought sort of what they may want to include. And even they went a step further, right? If you'll notice in November, they even put some additional reminders for themselves. Oh, put on a mouse guard. You know, think about my candy boards. Put on something for moisture control. So they kind of do a little bit more, but you'll get a good idea here. Um, for instance, if you see, go back up to July, they have 42 days. They've got even gave them some, some, some little pointers and tips on how to schedule of when to take these treatments on and off. So depending on, you know, here they're wanting to use Apivar in July. And so they're kind of giving themselves a heads up, you know. So this may be something, I show you these that folks have done because I want you to see, you know, this may be like real life, what yours looks like. And it may not look as detailed as the ones that we provided for you. Obviously it doesn't have to be, uh, there's no right or wrong answer here, it's totally up to you. All right, so let's show you another one, another one I really like that came from the workshops for packages. Um, this person, not obviously as much writing, but you can see they definitely thought about this whole process when they would do the inspections, um, when they would do, as far as doing the inspections, the things that they would, you know, they're requeening here, uh, they're going through, they're using a couple different products as needed, they put themselves some options there, which was good. Um, one thing I do want to discourage you, if you are filling these out, and you put a couple of options, you know, maybe put a star by the one you prefer, you know, or circle it or underline it, because Later on, when you write this, you go, oh my goodness, I don't think I can use all three of these at one time. So what, what was I meaning to tell myself here? So just give yourself a little pointer there of what will be your ideal or your first pick and then have some alternatives as you fill these out. Um, all right, so let me show you one last one, a good example of people who are getting nukes. So this is another good, I was trying to sort of think about all the different scenarios for most of the folks that may be on the call. Uh, by the way, the splits, could fall really nicely into this Nuke IPM. So you could do this as well. So for instance, most folks in our state, in Massachusetts, get Nukes in May. So you see, again, a lot of NAs if they, we don't have the Bs yet. And then similar to the packages, they build up fairly quickly, or sorry, slow build up, um, depending on if you're putting them on new equipment that's not been drawn out or drawn comb versus older equipment that has drawn comb. So here, for instance, you're putting Nuke into a hive that is a dead out from last year and you've got all this comb that's been drawn out, they may be much faster in their development versus a hive that's brand new with brand new frames and everything. So it might take them a little longer. Um, you're gonna need to be a little bit more mindful of how the population increases. And then as this increase sort of trickles, right, that you get ready for winter. And that, I think that's kind of always, I've had a couple of beekeepers tell me, uh, managing bees and thinking about bees in the Northeast is always thinking about winter. So I know we're always, and even though some of us may dread it, we're always thinking about it. You have to keep it in mind. And everything you do needs to get you prepared for it because it can be a big stress on bees if they're not ready for it. Um, so if we go over to the honey section for the honey flow, you may have an opportunity to get some honey off of a, a nuke especially if they're a really strong nuke out of the gate, but that uh, you know, depends on you, if that's something you would like to do. And the mite monitoring looks fairly similar, monthly, and then pre post treatment, and then the non-chemical tools. Um, you'll notice I put screen bottom boards because that seems to be real common for people to either have them or they don't have them. And a lot of people have questions about if they should put them on or take them off. So it's always a good option that's available, especially if you've uh, started out with bees. Um, yeah, so here we go. For non-chemical tools, other things that you can do in here. So obviously drone brood frames. If you're doing these, I do wanna just make one mention. You don't wanna have a drone nursery. So now I wanna make sure that you, if you have drone brood frames that you are taking them out. So you have to be a little mindful of this. This is one of those where if you're gonna do drone brood frames, you might wanna open your hive. You're gonna to have to maybe open it more than once a month, or you're at least gonna to have to kind of, if you open it right, and you may have to open it earlier in the next month if you open it like the middle of the previous month because you've got to be able to catch that drone through the life cycle. So 
this may not be a, a situation where you can say the first of every month I'm going to open my bees. You have to be a little flexible, right? If you're using some of these tools that may need you to require you to go in sooner and also time that with when your mite treatment may need to come on and off. And the length of your mite treatments, uh, we told you, we showed you and, and told you how to read labels and that gives you that information. So some good options here for treatments. You'll notice we're using Mite Away Quick Strips if you've got our Fort Pro, if you've got the Honey Super Zone. Apigard and once your population starts getting larger. The overall take home on all of these uh, plans, as you'll notice, is that you don't see the same treatment used over and over and over. I want to make sure that people are seeing that trend and notice it. The reason you're not seeing that is because, number one, we want you to have a lot of tools in your toolkit. So we want you to have a couple things available. So you need to order a couple of these products to have. And number two, we don't want to create a situation where mites are getting hit with the same chemical over and over and over, making it much easier for them to, to develop uh, so a little bit of resistance to them and possibly uh, persist in your colony way past any treatment. And then the next thing you know, right, none will work. So you want to have a, a couple tools there available to you. Um, these are good examples. They're, again, not the, the all that you can do. But, and, and again, this may take some time. So give yourself some time, really think about this. Uh, use a pencil, make a lot of scratches, make a couple copies. Um, yeah, so I think that, that can, will give you, we could, we, could have spent, we could spend hours going over these. And I do wanna make one, I uh, wanna throw out one suggestion for the people that have stuck in with the, with the presentation here. If you do this and you would like another person to look at it and you feel like, we, May not get an opportunity to have a bee meeting or something between now and then. Uh, we're happy to take a look at these for you. Um, obviously, we'll do the best we can. We can't tell you, you know, this is what you should or shouldn't do. We will give you some suggestions and help you kind of navigate if you have questions, or even if you have questions about how to do this and you're, you're still confused after the webinar. So, reach out to us. Um, we'd love to be able to offer that to our Massachusetts and Maine specific beekeepers and others as we can. So, just be mindful. We'll, do the best we can here on trying to help folks um, navigate these. So, all right, let's see what we got here left, Yana. We think we got a couple of updates for you. Right. Questions? Yeah, we actually, um, Jen has been beavering away answering uh, <laughs> questions. So, there are now 50 answered questions. Uh, so, if you put something in there, uh, check because it may have been written, uh, Jen may have given a written answer. So, um, I think uh, given time, uh, there's just one question I'm going to ask and, um, and, and then we'll move on because um, a lot of these questions have been answered. So um, as Sarah Vanan said, um, um, oh, where has that question gone? Sorry. Um, uh, give me two seconds because I, maybe it's been answered. <laughs> Um, yeah. uh, so he said he, uh, the, I think uh, this gentleman is uh, uh, writing from India and uh, he says here in India beekeepers sometimes face the problem of cross infections of Varroa from A. serena colonies to A. mellifera colonies, apologies if I drop that up, and vice versa. How can we manage this problem? Is, and is that relevant for the for 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 our neck of the woods? Uh, so probably well, I mean, unless we get Asian um, honeybees, then we 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 might have this cross infection. So originally, the varroa mite was associated with um, the Asian honeybee, and jumped over onto the one that we manage, the Western honeybee or the European honeybee, um, depending on who you talk to, and. Um, so we do get crosses between the two. They are, they go between the two species. And so in India, that's, that's a problem where both of those populations of honeybees coexist together. Um, how you manage it, I'm not quite sure. I don't know, Kim, do you have any ideas? I... Yeah, I mean, I, so I'm going to back up and say, if you think you have Apis serrana, please let your state acres know ASAP, because it is an invasive species in the United States, so I'll jump back there. But more importantly, to help you uh, support, yeah, I think it's tough, because Apis serrana, like Jen said, is, is a really u unusual bee species in the sense that it existed and has continued to exist with Varroa, and has created a very different set of tools to combat that. Uh, that parasite and what Apis mellifera has been able to do. So 
it's it's tough. I mean, I think it. I'm also not familiar with like chemical tools or, or cultural tools that may be different uh, or, or otherwise other non-chemical tools in India. So it would be hard for for us to maybe speak to that what's available. But um, yeah. There is really cool for any beekeeper on this on this call. Um, if you have the opportunity, Google Apis Sarana um, and their hives. They they have such a neat life history. They don't build inside structures; they build outside of of structures. So they build these kind of weird hanging nests. Really neat. Um, check them out. They are really cool. But yeah. And uh, one other one other question. Any comments on the seasonality of mite thresholds? And I assume the person is asking if the mite threshold would change with the season. Um. Yeah, so we definitely see, again, sort of that similar um, buildup, right, of mites that we talked about earlier that, that follows shortly after the bees uh, build up in population growth. Um, but the thresholds, I do see a lot of folks who seem to be a little bit more lenient in the mite thresholds as the season continues. Um, and, and may have a harder time getting that ideal 1% going into winter. So, you know, I, I think there's a little wiggle room there. Obviously, the 3% is the, the ultimate treatment threshold of when you definitely got to make sure you do some sort of treatment. And I even have beekeepers that have a hard time reaching 3%. Um, I don't, and I, maybe Jim, correct me and, and add to this, I'm not seeing any real data around how much you can deviate from the threshold and how, if, the, if it's correlated with winter survival in a sense, you can deviate a quarter of percent and your bees will still have this amount of percentage survival, you know, but I do think that, um, I think we're going to see a really big push to get to that 1% threshold as we continue in managing bees. I'm already starting to hear this in, in our, our world that we're living in, our other conversations that in the beekeeping community so yeah yeah there there is that there is the correlation between when you hit three percent you should you just stay below three percent like absolutely be below three percent once you get to five percent which is only six more mites in a 300 bee sample that's when you start really seeing those viruses get hold in those bees and then it's then it's a cascade a quick cascade after that um, of bee collapse. Um, I mean, I've seen hives survive with higher mites than that, but the vast majority don't. And so um, it's it's a it's a it's a very slippery slope after that nine. So you wanna you wanna definitely be below three uh, percent or nine mites per three hundred bees. Great. And I just saw a comment actually here from Steve Page. You may have left the call by now, but uh, he said, "Thank you for an excellent series. I've learned so much." I started with bees 45 years ago when it was easy, gave up when it got complicated, and now I have the knowledge and confidence to dive back in. Oh, Steve. Oh, oh. oh Steve is a beekeeper after my own heart. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we really appreciate the beekeepers. You know, they're, they're really good questions during this whole entire series. And, and those questions, have we, we look at them each week and then come up with some of our content for the following week so that we make sure that we hit those things that beekeepers are really struggling with or have questions about for the next one. So it's really the beekeepers that that drove this series and, and made it what it is. Um, and so Jan, I don't know if you mentioned, but we are gonna answer all these questions eventually. Yes, and we, um, I haven't mentioned that, but we ha have, we're keeping an active file of all the questions and uh, Jen and Kim have been soldiering through answering them and we will post them on our website uh, when we have them in a format uh, that's easy for you to scroll through and we've, um, we've put them by category so you can, you know, if you have questions about springtime questions with, you know, new packages, it'll be easy for you to find those. So uh, stay tuned, it's going to take us a little time to, to answer them and get them posted. But. All right, so let's uh, finish up here. Um, we have a poll to, uh, whoops, a daisy, sorry, if I can go back. There we go. Uh, some similar questions as we had before, uh, not exactly the same, and I'll just be quiet for a minute uh, so that you can answer the questions. Same thing, no wrong or right answers. It is not a test. It's simply uh, for us to get a sense of how this lands for people and how useful it's been for you. Okay, great. And then we can share the poll results with you. Um, so as a result of this webinar, um, how likely are you to increase your implantation of IPM? And 48% uh, said very like, extremely likely. So that is a great news. I'm sure that warms the cockles of their hearts. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, this is a question about um, uh, what are some methods that you could use? And um, you can see the most often used one there is mitocytes. I don't think there are any wrong answers on this one. Is that correct? Okay, they're all good. All right, great. Um, and 77% um, and of people are planning on using a plan and 17% of those who are not already have one. So that's really great news, which is a big difference from when we started out at the beginning of this webinar with 50-50. Um, and the most common answer of why uh, they're not going to make a plan is they already have one. So that's great. And uh, yeah, we have 37% saying other. So I'm sure if you answered other to that question, um, that Jen and Kim and I would love to know what other is. And uh, maybe we can address that. Um, and uh, so, yes, thank you very much. All right. So um, we're quickly just going to go over. Um, some uh, resources here. If you're interested in doing research with a researcher in the Northeast, we have a site on our webpage uh, where you can go and put your details and, um, and say what you're interested in. And it's a way for us to uh, connect researchers and farmers and apiarists with each other um, to be involved in research. So please feel free to do that. Uh, the recording will be ready in about a week. And um, and uh, you, this is the link. I'll send an email to you. If you're registered for this webinar, um, you'll, you'll receive an email. And Jen and Kim, I'll let, you, I'll let you talk about these things. Well, we're going to do a shameless plug. Thank you for holding on, 131 folks, uh, to the end. We're going to do a shameless plug again for the Apiary Inspectors of America. If you are not, obviously, in Maine or Massachusetts, um, which is our group that we uh, work with, then you can find your Apiary Inspector by going to apiaryinspectors.org and looking for the inspection services and you'll see a whole list of these wonderful folks in this photo um, that would be very happy to assist you. Unfortunately, some states may not have an apiary inspection program, but if you're curious, uh, you can go to that website and look for inspection services and find out. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. There's probably a lot of awesome things happening close to home as well. So for you, check it out. Um, I do want to just do one quick, we, we've been promoting this Fight the Might workshop. I did talk to Hannah Whitehead, who's the extension person at UMass, and uh, we are still going to do these. Basically, it will be uh, the webinar series, if you've watched all of these, oh my goodness, how many hours now, everybody? Like eight hours, <laughs> almost worth of listening to Jen and I talk about might management. It's a very similar format, except it's obviously in person and uh, has a lot more opportunities than what we could do uh, virtually, as you can see in this photo, like teaching each other how to physically put on the mite treatments uh, in person and giving you case studies so you can also kind of go through examples of how to help people manage mites and of course the ability to talk with beekeepers is just really valuable. So stay tuned, we have not forgotten about this. We did have to cancel the original May date, uh, giving all the COVID closures, but we are planning to offer one, if not two of these. So if you are interested, it would really help us to email. If you go to the website, uh, you've got the contact information, email Hannah and let her know, because I know we've got enough people interested obviously in one. I think we have enough people interested in two, but we may even have enough for three. So if you, if you share your interest, we'd be willing to accommodate you. And who knows, we might can get Jen Lund, uh, fabulous from Maine to come down and be in these with us so that would be awesome Great. so uh just want to make one more plug here for our health surveys so jen and i are both doing health surveys if you uh if you go to our website uh, mass.gov obviously you can google mdar apiary program or mdar honeybees and you'll find us really quick there's a have honeybees and complete the be aware survey link and it'll take you to a really quick uh, eight page, I promise, very quick survey to tell me about your bee practices and more importantly, um, if your bees made it through the winter. So this is great data for us to have at the local level. It really helps us plan our efforts in providing education and then also troubleshooting health issues around the state. So I'll let Jen in the next slide talk about hers a little bit too. And we have a similar thing. We have a yearly beekeeper survey. It's completely anonymous. If you just go type in Maine Apiary DACF or, you know, um, bees, it'll come up as one of the options. And right at the top of the page, there's a link to fill out the survey. If you're from Maine, absolutely, we need your data. Um, it helps me um, figure out what's going on around the state and come up with those wonderful loss numbers and, and other management strategies that people are using in the state. But it also helps us, both Kim and I, focus 
where we're gonna, what we're gonna focus on um, the following year. So if we see beekeepers are losing hives for certain reasons, it's something that we can focus on when we talk to the bee clubs and to beekeepers and make them aware of those losses. So thank you in advance for filling them out and they take about 15 minutes, about 15 minutes. Great. So. All right, wonderful. I'll do one more plug real quick, Yana. Oh, can you see this? Oh, maybe you can't. Okay. There you maybe. go. Third dimension. Okay, so if you do fill out uh, the survey for Massachusetts, you could get one of these really swanky be aware signs that we're sending beekeepers. You can see this one's, well, you can't see it, but this one's ready to go out. Um, so yeah, if you fill it out, we'll, we'll give you a little be aware sign that you can put in your yard. Um, yeah, do, you, do you send the magic ones that, that, that fade in and out? <laughs> oh, yeah, we should do that, Jen. That should be a holographic one. We should do that next year. If, if you fill out the main survey, you just get my heart. You get, thank you, the heart. You, also, you don't get any free well, stuff well, in the mail. You, you know what, though? We can, we can do one more plug here for uh, my wash jars and screens. I did not, I forgot to do that. So, Jen, do you want to share real quick about that? Yep. If you're a main beekeeper, absolutely contact me. Um, send me any email and I can send you a might wash jar in the mail. Um, and Massachusetts, you'll send them might wash jars in the mail too. And yep. if you're from out of state, we'll send you a screen. Can yep. we still do that? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah we'll send screens. We're not going to send the whole jar, but uh, you can get a screen and you just have to find your own canning jar. Yeah. Great. What a deal. So wonderful. Well, thank you very much for coming and in, being inside on a sunny day, which is a precious commodity in the in the Northeast at the moment. So um, thank you very, very much for sharing all your expertise and your love and passion for bees. It just shines right through. And uh, I know a lot of people have found this valuable. So thanks and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Happy Patriots Day. <laughs> thank y'all so much, y'all. Yep. Bye y'all. Uh,